to Women Lead, a production of the Women of Color Empowerment Institute. We are your hosts. I'm Kathy Eggleston. And I'm Bernadette Norris Weeks. Our other co-host, Michelle Austin Pammies, is on assignment today. Our show today will focus on how red states are overriding blue cities and the loss of local control. In short, this show is about preemption, a doctrine that holds that certain matters are to take precedence over local law. For instance, if a state law is inconsistent with a local law, the state law will control, even if the local law makes more sense for the local area. There have been several recent news stories about the trend to take away local control at the state level. Increasingly, the trend is being seen in red states where blue or democratic counties are targeted. So our first guest today is Broward County, Florida Commissioner Dale V.C. Holness, and he'll discuss with us the impact preemption is having at the local level and how local decision-making authority that is closest to the people may be being severely eroded. Our second guest is Ben Wilcox. He is the Research Director of Integrity Florida, a nonpartisan research institute dedicated to promoting integrity in government and exposing public corruption. He will speak with us today about how overturning municipal and county decisions in democratic localities has spread in recent years. You know, uh, Michelle and I represent governmental entities, and so we're seeing this happen more and more at the municipal level where um, the state legislature is really preempting things that the residents want. Um, if you look at, for instance, the, the county of Sarasota, they um, passed by a referendum with their voters uh, years ago um, a cap on campaign contributions, of, uh, and they capped it to $200 per candidate per cycle. Well, um, the city of Sarasota came back a few years after that and they did the same thing. But in this past legislative session, the state legislature and, um, enacted and the governor just signed um, a bill that would now require, um, or not require, but allow for uh, campaign contributions of up to $1,000 per candidate per you know, election cycle. Well, this is clearly contrary to what the voters voted for in those areas. It's actually five times more than the voters wanted um, in terms of uh, campaign finance for their area. That is so interesting. This is not something that I was really aware of or on my radar screen, but you know, as a voter, it needs to be. I'm aware that the city of Fort Lauderdale has a cap of $250, for example on campaign contributions. So this is something that's very important and we need to talk about this concept. We absolutely need to talk about it because all of these things go away. If the state legislature preempts um, through you know passage of something, whatever they're doing in Tallahassee, and they don't necessarily know why people at the local level are passing these bills, you know, it's I think it's unfair to the residents who um, deserve to be represented with government closest to them uh, representing their interests. Well, this is something we definitely need to inform people about, and we will be right back with our first guest, Commissioner Dale V.C. Holness. Stay with us. At the Women of Color Empowerment Institute, our mission is to enhance and expand leadership by women of color. We do this in a variety of different ways, including but not limited to providing mentorship opportunities for young professionals where we assist in helping to create paths to leadership. We empower women to develop capacities for social change. We produce programs that promote heritage awareness, and we provide training opportunities for business and government. Our institute holds seminars focused on professional success techniques, and we host many other events such as our popular Advocates for Change and Leaders Connect. The Women of Color Empowerment Institute publishes a magazine called Women Lead. Our signature event is the Women of Color Empowerment Conference, a yearly conference where hundreds of leaders gather from all across the United States and beyond. To learn more about membership and how you can support our programs or be a sponsor of the Women Lead TV, visit us at nationalwomenofcolor.com. Again, that's nationalwomenofcolor.com. The law office of Austin Pammy's Norris Weeks Powell is a full service law firm practicing in the area of governmental law including the representation of municipalities, civil litigation, personal injury, real estate, and corporate transactional matters. With over 100 years of collective experience, our attorneys are admitted to practice before 
state courts, federal courts, and the United States Supreme Court. We are conveniently located in downtown Fort Lauderdale and can be reached at 954-768-9770. Or for more information about the law firm of Austin, Pammy's, Norris, Weeks, Powell, visit our website at apnwlaw.com. That's APNWLaw.com. Welcome back to Women Lead. We are pleased to have with us County Commissioner Dale V.C. Holness. Thank you so much for joining us, Commissioner. I'm so grateful to be here with you, lovely ladies. This is a very, very important program, the empowerment of women. It is critical that we empower everyone in our community. It's about time to have a program like this. Well, thank, thank you. you. We appreciate that. Of course, we're talking about preemption right now uh, in our program today and what's particularly happening with uh, Republican states that have large Democratic cities uh, like South Florida, um, although it's not a city, but South Florida is uh, hugely Democratic. And uh, what uh, measures are being put in place to really preempt the local laws? And I know that you were the mayor of Broward County during the time of uh, the height of COVID, I should say. It feels like COVID, you know, the beginning of it was so long ago, but it really wasn't. It was just like a few months ago, right? Months, yes. <laughs> but um, you were the mayor having to make a lot of difficult decisions along with and alongside our county administrator, uh, Bertha Henry. And so in that role, um, can you tell us about some of the things that you had to do in terms of navigating, uh, dealing with Tallahassee, and also um, making sure that you could keep your local community safe. Well, it's a period of time that we had. This pandemic really changed lives. It, it bring about different types of operation for government. Uh, so maneuvering with the state laws and many of the rules and regulations we had to make as we go along. There weren't any prescription, any, 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 anything that's in place that says, you have a pandemic, you, this is how you do, deal with it. Uh, so certainly working with the state, with the governor's office, uh, finding ways to put regulations in place that would mandate for the safety of the residents of South Florida. But at the same time, not being too overbearing and, and causing businesses to fail. It was a lot that we had to work through, I must tell you. Uh, to put in place a stay-at-home order, to mandate mask wearing, to even put some restriction in terms of uh, how late you can be out, curfews. But we needed to find that balance because lives were at risk. We are certainly the commercial economic center of the state of Florida. We generate more revenues as a region than any other region. We're a donor region, right? We are a donor region, which means to, to the voters, South Florida, Broward County, Palm Beach County, uh, send more money to Tallahassee than we usually get back. I know certainly for Broward County, we do. We send more money to Washington, D.C. than we get back in terms of the grants and the, the money that comes from the federal government or the state uh, government. And, and that should say something. We should be able to have a little more autonomy, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah. that's not necessarily the case uh, because you pay more in. The state uh, of South Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Commissioner, I want to pick up on, on a word that you said um, in your first answers with, with Bernadette, and that is consensus. And, um, you know, it's a case study. You're working at the county level, um, having all of these municipalities and, and three counties in South Florida all have, you know, more than 20 municipalities each. And so you didn't seek to just summarily impose the county will without discussions with the municipalities of what's in their their different interests, bringing everybody to the table and coming up with a consensus. And I've got to say, I'm concerned about the general climate in government all the way up to the federal level that we're losing our ability for elected officials to um, understand that the, the skill set of building consensus is in the interest of, of citizens. It what, is. What say you? Too much polarization. We need to get to where we understand that consensus is important. 
that working collaboratively is critical to building a bright future for everyone. And not everyone's going to get exactly what they want. We need to understand we need to work for the common good first. Uh, I'm very concerned that we also are seeing a lot of activity around election laws and uh, states just changing long-held election standards, laws, voting rights seems to be under, under attack. The more people that we allow to participate in a democratic system, the better we are. The more voices that are being heard, the better we are. To restrict that is not good. We're not China, we're not Russia, and we see countries around the world who over time have restricted people's rights to vote, to access the ballot box, not be successful. Maybe for a short time they are. But in the long run, the freedom and the rights that we enjoy as American came, Americans come from that ballot box. And we take it for granted now that the, this democratic system will always be here. The more that we get people to vote, the better it is for all of us. But Commissioner, I mean, uh, absolutely. Um, but these um, law changes are uh, seeing momentum and success all across the country, just flat out. What do we do about this? It's in the hands of the people. And the people have to understand that we, as a people, need not reward folks who want to do wrong. And it might seem to be in your short-term interest today, but in the long term, where is it taking our country to? Well, I'll tell you a preemption that I would like to see, and that's at the federal government level on the to the states, pushing down to the states and passing some of these um, laws that are now up at the federal government level, like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the For the People Act. Mm -hmm. You know, these are two things that if um, hand, they go together hand in hand, right. and if these laws were to pass in Congress, then those federal laws would preempt these um, terrible things that the, some of these states are doing to suppress votes. So that's the kind of preemption that I want to so, see. <laughs> so, 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 so to your point, the Constitution allows for that because the Congress is elected across the country. Of course, right. So, so that's an election process right. that they can say, here's the election process that needs to be in place for governance when it comes to elected members of Congress, members of the Senate, the presidency, and that will follow true to the rest of it. And now, full disclosure for our audience, you are currently running for Congress in the in the 20th district uh, here in, in uh, South Florida, uh, the seat of our beloved uh, late Congressman Alcee Hastings. And, you know, he was also a friend of the Institute, like a really good friend of the Institute, on our committees for the conferences. And um, I'm telling you, when I tell you he will be missed by all of us um, who are members. And, it's, and, it's and, a and by deal. me, certainly also. We were at some of those conferences yes, together, yes. both of us. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the Congressman was a mentor, uh, a real guide for me, someone that I relied on heavily. Uh, and I'm so grateful that uh, we had his service for these many years. He was a voice for those who were voiceless. He stood up when others wouldn't. So let's um, pivot back to um, this issue of preemption. And so we hear so much about flooding in South Florida. I mean, it's a really huge deal and how developers uh, may not be paying their fair share, uh, but yet they're with this new legislation that was just signed up in Tallahassee, it's going to severely limit the way that cities and counties um, require developers to contribute to the cost of new roads, schools, or infrastructure that's really needed and required for this development that um, you know they'll be doing for these projects. I mean, how is the county going to handle this issue, and, and, and what do you think in general about this? Well, uh, anyone who thinks the environment isn't changing, I don't know where they're living. They're probably on a different planet. We see it here in South Florida. Las Olas, high, uh, when there's a full moon, tide goes up, water's on the street. We now have to build pumps to move that water out. Even without a great flood, there's an issue already with the tide rising at full moon. We're going to have to sit down, our administration, with the rest of my colleagues and the county commission and formulate a plan. How we deal with this? Where do we find the funding for? From? 
Uh, we know that more developments bring more people. And as such, we're going to have more congestion uh, on our streets. Uh, there will be greater need for people to move about when there is severe flooding. So everyone needs to contribute to this. And, and sadly, this legislation won't allow us to do what we would probably believe is the best thing locally. And, and again, the people who are closest to the electorate are your local government. They understand the flooding issues. They understand the road congestion issues. We need to be able to deal with those issues on a local level and not have what's called home rule taken away from us. Public safety is another issue that has Huge. come up in the yes. recent session and, and all across the country uh, with uh, states, uh, you know, preempting local control of things down, down to the budget level of, uh, of police and sheriffs. Um, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? We'll have a budget this year of $5.8 billion to take care of the 2 million people in Broward County. The largest single item in that budget is for jails, $300 million. Here's something else that I discovered this past few months. 47% of the people who are in jail in Broward County are on some sort of psychotropic drugs. Mm -hmm. They have mental issues. You're right. 47%. That's awesome. Is that the best way to deal with people? Should we build some supportive housing where we can help them build their lives, make them productive, make sure they're taking their medicine, rather than put them in jail at $161 a night, oftentimes for minor offenses? Mm -hmm. To take away local government ability to deal with these issues is wrong and doesn't benefit us. Well, I, I, I'll tell you that we've really enjoyed having you. Um, and full disclosure, you've been actually, at one point, you were my district commissioner. And just thank you for coming in and, and answering our questions today. This has been a fantastic show. Well, thanks to you and to Women of Color Empowerment for having an empowering program to empower our community. And I believe that not just women will benefit from this. The entire community will benefit. So thank you so much. We'll be right back. After these messages with our next guest, Ben Wilcox, who is the Research Director of Integrity Florida. Stay tuned. At the Women of Color Empowerment Institute, our mission is to enhance and expand leadership by women of color. We do this in a variety of different ways, including but not limited to providing mentorship opportunities for young professionals where we assist in helping to create paths to leadership. We empower women to develop capacities for social change. We produce programs that promote heritage awareness, and we provide training opportunities for business and government. Our institute holds seminars focused on professional success techniques, and we host many other events such as our popular Advocates for Change and Leaders Connect. The Women of Color Empowerment Institute publishes a magazine called Women Lead. Our signature event is the Women of Color Empowerment Conference, a yearly conference where hundreds of leaders gather from all across the United States and beyond. To learn more about membership and how you can support our programs or be a sponsor of the Women Lead TV, visit us at nationalwomenofcolor.com. Again, that's nationalwomenofcolor.com. The law office of Austin Pammy's Norris Weeks Powell is a full-service law firm practicing in the area of governmental law, including the representation of municipalities, civil litigation, personal injury, real estate, and corporate transactional matters. With over 100 years of collective experience, our attorneys are admitted to practice before state courts, federal courts, and the United States Supreme Court. We are conveniently located in downtown Fort Lauderdale and can be reached at 954-768-9770. Or for more information about the law firm of Austin Pammy's Norris Weeks Powell, visit our website at apnwlaw.com. That's apnwlaw.com. Be sure to save the date for the 10th Annual Women of Color Empowerment Conference to take place September 11th, 2021 at the Hilton Beach Resort in Fort Lauderdale.
be sure to go on nationalwomenofcolor.com to find out more about sponsorship opportunities and how you can be a part of this amazing conference on social justice in America. We'll see you there. And until then, be empowered. Welcome back to Women Lead. We have with us Ben Wilcox from Integrity Florida, a nonpartisan research institute dedicated to promoting integrity in government. Thank you for joining us. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me on the program today. Tell us about Integrity Florida and why the organization was initially started. Integrity Florida is a nonpartisan research institute and government watchdog. We were founded in January 2012, and to date we've written and published over 20 research reports on various aspects of, of Florida government. Our, some of our latest research focused on the issue of preemption. So there appears to be a rise in aggressive efforts being made by Republican governors to override local laws in Democratic-controlled cities and counties. We saw this in South Florida with health rules during the pandemic. What is your research showing as to whether similar efforts are being made to erode local control, particularly in large urban areas in other states? Governor DeSantis has certainly been a proponent of using preemption to tell local governments how to respond to the COVID crisis. We've also seen preemption used in other states and not just Republican controlled states trying to preempt uh, democratic cities. We've also seen preemption used by Demo uh, states that are controlled by Democrats. Uh, so it's, re it's really just an issue of who's got the power. In a recent CNN article entitled, It's Not Just Voting and COVID, How Red States Are Overriding Their Blue Cities, that preemption is now being used as a strategy. Can you explain what you meant by that statement? Florida used to be uh, used sparingly to ensure there was some consistency between state and local regulations, but lately it's really just gotten out of hand uh, in the Florida legislature. We're seeing an average of 40 preemption bills filed each year in the legislature for the past three years. And we, we call it a strategy because it really is much easier for a corporate or a business interest to fight local regulation at the state level than to wage battle in, in every locality. Uh, a good example is the preemption that passed this year involving the uh, uh, cruise ship industry. It, it preempted uh, local ordinances in the city of Key West that were adopted by Key West voters to restrict the size of, of cruise ships that dock in the port of Key West. And so, the cruise industry went to the legislature and got, got those local ordinances preempted. Following the George Floyd murder, there's been a lot of emphasis on the reallocating of resources to better address training, mental health, and the over-policing in black and brown communities. Given a new preemption law recently signed by Florida's governor pertaining to police budgets, what should our viewers know if their local police budgets are reallocated or decreased, even when fully warranted? Yes, the police budget preemption that you're referring to was part of House Bill 1, the so-called Anti-Riot Act that was passed by the legislature this year. And, and, and even though it doesn't use the word preemption, it really is a preemption. What it, what it, what it says is if a local government decides to reduce their law enforcement or police budget, then a citizen of that local government can appeal that decision to the governor's office. The governor's office is supposed to do an investigation and then can make a recommendation to the governor and cabinet, which can then overturn or overrule that, that budget reduction that the uh, local government has deemed to be necessary. So uh, even though it doesn't, it doesn't use the word preemption, it really is a way for the state to override local government decisions. We see how large urban areas like South Florida end up keeping the entire state's economy afloat. On the other hand, there seems to be no issue off limits where the legislature will not interfere 
in these largely democratic areas, is there any movement afoot to slow down this overreach? I think there's an argument to be made that it should take more than a simple majority vote to amend the Constitution. Uh, but the, pro the problem is you don't want to put the threshold too high or it will limit the will of, of the voters. The current 60% uh, threshold was approved in 2006, uh, and the proposals to increase that threshold to 67% uh, have not passed the legislature. I think the 60% uh, threshold has worked well and has uh, kept some things out of the Constitution that probably shouldn't have been there, while still allowing uh, you know some really important uh, amendments to pass. As it now stands, Florida requires approval of 60% of voters to change the state constitution, but bills were filed in this past session to increase the threshold from 60% to 67%, which no ballot initiative has ever met. What is the status of those bills, and do you believe that these types of initiatives ultimately will limit the will of the voters? No, there, there really is no political will in the legislature to slow down this increasing trend of, of preemption. Uh, in our latest research report, we did put out some policy options that if there was some political will to reduce the trend to preempt local government, then uh, you know, policymakers could consider these options. Uh, one option would be to uh, require a two-thirds vote uh, to pass a preemption. Uh, another option would be to have a single subject requirement for preemption, so you don't get multiple preemptions contained in one bill, giving legislators a Hobson's choice of having to you know, choose whether to support the whole package or oppose the whole package. And then the final uh, policy option would be to have a sunset provision uh, for preemptions that would require the legislature to come back in, uh, you know, in, in a period of time and review a preemption uh, to, to determine if it's still needed and, and, and then act proactively to uh, maintain the preemption or it would go out of existence. Mr. Wilcox, it was great having you as a guest today. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, that's our time for today. Until next time, be empowered. empowered.